this one freeze up. So good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the next instalment in our Cornwall Wildlife Trust Marine Team um, talks. And this afternoon, we're joined by Mark Parry, who is not underwater. He's actually in front of an amazing uh, aquarium uh, in Plymouth at the National Marine Aquarium. And Mark's here to tell us all about uh, a very exciting project involving seagrass restoration and advanced moorings. So uh, take it away, Mark. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to go through over the next 30 minutes is a series of about 18 slides. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen with you, this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the anticipated time is about 30 minutes, um, which gives us some time for questions. And I think the best way to answer, ask any questions is, uh, is through Matt. So um, chatting through the, the, the option there. So just a personal introduction of why I'm sat here talking to you. Um, I'm, um, uh, I'm a Plymovian, born and bred. Um, I'm 43 years old. I grew up fortunate enough to um, be fascinated in the sea and, and playing in the sea. And um, I guess that fascination turned into a profession um, when, I, um, when I studied in Plymouth and, and studied oceanography or, or marine sports science. Um, that subsequently rolled into a career of environmental habitat assessments for oil and gas. And um, when that got a little bit tiring, spending so much time at sea, I came to work for the National Marine Aquarium. So the National Marine Aquarium is owned and operated by the Ocean Conservation Trust, uh, which is its sort of parent charity. And we're one of two charitable or large sort of charitable organizations that use Aquaria to try and promote the message of, uh, of um, positive, positivity about our ocean environment and care for it. Um, and we have various different sort of involvements in international projects, as well as uh, running the country's uh, largest marine aquarium, which we're probably most known for. Um, so the Ocean Conservation Trust is involved in a really important European Union funded project um, for the next three years, four years. Um, and I believe Fiona Crouch spoke to you yesterday about that project. It's the Remedies Project, uh, reducing and mitigating the erosion and disturbance impacts affecting the seabed. So whilst this focus of this talk is on seagrasses, and we're, we're going to talk about restoring seagrasses, and firstly, sort of conservation of seagrasses through um, uh, advanced mooring systems, this, the, some of the methodologies for, for conservation to be put into any context for any sort of um, protected feature within a Annex 1 habitat. And I don't know um, how, how in-depth Fiona went yesterday. Um, so, this afternoon, I'm just going to cover why we're worried about seagrasses and then seagrass conservation through our advanced mooring system trials and developments, and then also seagrass restoration through the, through the Remedies Project, of which there's multiple partners and there are multiple different um, um, sort of work packages or, or um, conservation efforts from behavior change to education to restoration to um, conservation efforts as well. So um, why are we worried about seagrasses? Um, well, seagrasses is the ocean's only flowering plant. And I suppose recently there's been quite a bit of focus on seagrasses because um, they're very efficient at storing carbon. Um, and it's sort of hard to get your head around the mechanism of how that works um, because the sort of above ground biomass of, of seagrasses is quite small. And you, you think about a forest and you think about a seagrass bed, um, but they're, they're sort of um, on par for storing or sequestering the same amount of carbon. And arguably seagrasses are a little bit more effective. Um, but because seagrasses are a primary producer, um, they provide a 3D habitat, a complex um, habitat, um, certainly more complex than sort of bare sediments and sands, um, similar to our, um, our wonderful kelps. 
um, then they create nursery and um, hatchery and foraging grounds for some of our commercial fish, many of our commercial fish. Um, and they also find sediments and um, regulate the chemical and physical elements of the nearshore area. So the coastal management elements people are less interested in, but if you're an oceanographer, uh, which I traditionally studied, which was ocean, uh, which oceanography rather than marine biology, um, then those, those parts to me are quite interesting. Um, so I've got a video here of some tropical seagrasses. They're not temperate seagrasses, they're in very shallow water. And just to sort of coin or, or just to praise why we're interested in seagrasses, every second breath that we breathe comes from the ocean. Um, now, some of that is coastal vegetative habitats, uh, much of it is plankton, but this video is uh, of, of you can see seagrass photosynthesis in action. Um, it's not something that necessarily you look at the plants around you and, and have the ability to see. So the, uh, the plant is using the, the energy from the sun to, um, um, uh, to photosynthesize using carbon to, to um, make its, um, its body, uh, body mass and then um, releasing oxygen. So seagrass is a, a hugely important worldwide and they're one of the most um, uh, productive marine habitats that we've got in the UK. So the Ocean Conservation Trust along with the partners involved in, in remedies um, have been working on various different sort of uh, elements within a, within a greater um, project to, to understand or to, to try and um, remedy the decline in, in our British seagrasses. So the third thing I'm going to talk about is um, uh, the Sterling Advanced Mooring System. Um, so, the idea about the Sterling Advanced Mooring System um, was is adaptation of the traditional mooring configuration that provides the security of the traditional mooring whilst reducing the impacts on sensitive seabed habitats. So, this mooring style has been developed with the Conservation Trust over the last five years in conjunction with harbour authorities on the south coast of England and mooring services providers. Um, the aim has been to create a cost-effective, cost um, flexible mooring solution that remedies the impact of traditional moorings on habitats that have ecological value. So our traditional mooring has a concrete block that uh, is, the, is the anchor, and then there's a riser um, that anchors the vessel to the, um, to the seabed through that, that heavy weight. And through tidal exchange and um, wind changing direction when the vessel's on it, this can produce a, a sort of halo scour effect. So one of the things that we wanted to do throughout the course of this project is reduce the impact of, of moorings. It's probably worth saying at this point that we do view moorings and anchorings as, as two separate activities, or they are two separate activities. Um, but what I'm going to cover in the next few minutes is just the work on moorings. Um, so the Sterling Advanced Mooring System, what we wanted to do was use materials that the boating community is confident in um, in a British setting. So there are other mooring systems available around, uh, around the world. Uh, many of them rely upon a, a bungee sort of road, a, a bungee riser. So the different components of the mooring are the, the anchor, the riser, and the, this sort of surface flotation, the buoys you can tie to it. Um, but the majority of overseas solutions have a, uh, have a, a bungee element to them which is acceptable if your tidal range is, is reasonably small. Um, and there are some options that are, um, are suitable for um, large tidal ranges. But as I said, what we wanted to do was try and create a really sort of cost effective um, uh, mooring solution that could be adopted by, by more harbour authorities or, or, and also the boat users, I guess, would have a um, uh, have confidence in. 
So the the mooring to start off with started reasonably sort of Heath Robinson. What we decided to do was experiment with trying some flotation to the chain to see if we could reduce the impact of that scour around the mooring. Um, and we worked with the Sulcombe Harbour Authority to develop this idea. And there's been various iterations until we've got to a, a very robust and stable and um, uh, industry ready solution through, um, through various iterations. But that's an illustration of it. There is a helical screw at the, at the base of it. Um, the chain length is dependent upon the, uh, the water depth. And those of you that are familiar with um, standard mooring configurations will might wonder at the base of the mooring, there's usually a fracture chain and that chain's a lot heavier than the rest of the riser and that, um, that's there to sort of weight the chain down and, and keep the boat in position, um, keeping it safe. So we've removed that to reduce the impact and um, we've, uh, we've added some flotation. Um, why is that important? Well, if we have a 10 meter, um, if we have a well, 11, 10, 11 meter mooring chain, and the halo effect on that, uh, that mooring is five meters. And that's traditionally some of the impacts that we've monitored away from the central mooring location to where we see the, the minimum amount of, uh, or where we see the, sea, see the habitat unaffected, I should say, um, is about five meters. Um, and if we can reduce that down, our work firstly focused upon the riser. So, getting the riser off the ground so that halo didn't exist. Um, if we can reduce that five meters down to 0 0.5 meters for the diameter of the block, uh, uh, the concrete block a meter, um, then what we're effectively doing is reducing the impact of that mooring by 99%. Um, and then by going a step further, by using a helical anchor that's screwed into the sediment, um, then we can reduce that down to a, a sort of 10 centimeter radius with this riser that's um, coming off the seabed and um, securely anchoring the vessel when moored to it. Um, I think this video should work. So this is what it looks like in practice. And this is a, a trial that is taking place in Four Sands and um, something that we've historically worked on. Um, within the project that Fiona spoke about yesterday, we'll be rolling out uh, various different trials of, or iterations of, um, of moorings. Um, but some of these will be included in that trial. So you can see that's at um, low water. And um, you can see that there's enough flotation to keep that chain off the ground. Um, and the, um, the surface buoy is providing a, a stable um, anchor for the, the vessel to be tied up onto. Um, let me just play it again. Oh, it's okay. Um, and as the tide uh, rises and falls, then that system sort of rises and falls with the, uh, with the tide. Anecdotally, we've had these, as well, the engineering um, has been inspected this autumn and as the divers the surface supply divers that we use to assess the that the um the mooring is secure and, and uh, not uh well free from corrosion um, whilst not biologists have reported back that there is seagrass growing uh, right up to the pin um and uh, unfortunately through lockdown we're not able to get out and have a look at the, uh, the regeneration of the of this trial but from anecdotal feedback it seems very positive um, oh. some historic data that got us here these are the only graphs that are involved in the whole uh, whole presentation i promise you um, but this is the this details the leaf length of plants around a central mooring with the sterling mooring riser on. Um, it was deployed in 2016, and then we monitored it for a 12 month period after. 
Um, what happened in between the first mooring going in and um, the, the next set of data is that there was a failure within the system. So this, uh, the flotation came off and the, float, the, the mooring started acting as a traditional mooring. Um, so if we take it from the second point, you can see that reasonably quickly over a period of 12 months, we start seeing um, leaf length return to that that we would have expected. Um, uh, well, the, the length of, of leaf at five meters is returned back to um, before the point of failure. And at 0 0.5 meters, which is the blue column, um, what we're seeing is, um, uh, is extended growth and, and um, additional plants. So the next graph is the shoot count and same um, similar sort of pattern. Mooring went in, failure of mooring system, but um, you can see through the second, third and fourth set of columns, which is 2017, there were two sampling events in that, and 2018, there is a, there is a quite a quick return of the habitat um, once that system has been installed. And that sort of falls in line with some of the, um, some of the reports and anecdotal reports that we've been receiving back from um, uh, our inspection divers of the, uh, of the mooring. Um, that mooring trial is, is currently in conjunction with the Marine Conservation Society. Princess, Princess Yachts are providing the, um, uh, the funding for this trial um, and for the installations. And Tamar Estuaries, Estuaries Consultative Forum, which is the management authority for the, uh, for the SANG in Plymouth, um, is, uh, is a partner in that as well and providing a lot of support. So within the Remedies project, there will be um, various um, trials in different locations, um, different, different sort of environmental um, exposures with regards to wind and tide and with those different geographical positions then we'll trial a suite of different um, different moorings um, some of which will be bungee roads and some of which will be the um, the sterling advanced mooring system which is, is now much more of a robust and, and sort of industry ready solution um, so Within the, um, within the UK, over the last sort of, um, um, well, since the 1940s, there's been an estimated loss of seagrass in the region of about 90%. So when you look at the historical, um, well, it, it's based on the, I, the uh, habitat suitability model. And if there's X amount of habitat that would have been available for seagrasses to grow, and um, we now only have in the vicinity of about 7,000 hectares. Um, we've lost prospectively about 90%. Um, now we've got better records for the loss of um, salt marshes, and we've lost about 90% of our salt marshes. So the data does imply that we're, we're losing an, a large amount of our seagrasses, and with some of that. Um, uh, some of that mechanism of loss being um, identified and, and remedied, um, then you would expect that for it to grow back. And I guess the first point is that if, if, if your conservation efforts aren't effective, then you really do have to um, think about the second stage, and it's quite a drastic measure, which is restoration. And I think restoration of any habitat is, is complicated and drastic and, and really the last resort, um, yet alone of one of a, of a sub, subtitle habitat um, like seagrass. Um, so the, um, the other element of this project that uh, the Ocean Conservation Trust is involved in is, is um, uh, replanting seagrasses. Um, so I'm just going to sort of cover why we would want to do that. Um, so, on the left here, we've got our image of our, our sea grasses, and in the UK, they'll grow up to about sort of 50, 60 centimeters. Um, 
and the reproductive shoots can grow a meter, a meter and a half. And the reproductive shoots are, are seen this, well, they appear slightly different. They're a little bit um, greener in color. And rather than this sort of leaf, uh, this single strap that they're branched. So each, uh, each branch has a spathe of seeds. But um, this sort of explains why we would want to try and restore seagrasses um, in the sense that it, it, um, it's enabling sediment stabilization and it's enabling the, um, the habitat to s accumulate um, different organic matters. And seagrasses have, there's a lot of, um, there's a sort of lot of publication that seagrasses store carbon up to 35 times more efficiently than, um, than uh, ter terrestrial environments. And that's a little bit hard to get your head around because when you think of a forest, you can think of the trees and this, this huge amount of above ground biomass. Um, but when you consider the rate of sedimentation or the, re the rate of deposit of carbon within the sediment, which is really the way that the IPCC sort of register um, carbon sequestration, then um, seagrass is, is considerably more efficient than accumulating that, um, that uh, sedimentation and therefore storing carbon in the ground. Um, coastal habitats are particularly effective at doing this because of um, sort of uh, water movement around the coastal environment and that accumulation of sediment, but also without the presence of fire or oxygen, then it's really hard for that carbon to remineralize back into carbon dioxide. Whereas in a terrestrial environment, what you're effectively doing is taking the carbon or storing the carbon in the, the, the um, above ground biomass of a tree, and then it's quite easy to remineralize it back into carbon dioxide. So the reason that seagrasses or coastal habitats are becoming of interest as a carbon offset is because you really are sort of locking it up, you're putting it into the ground and um, you are, you're getting, you're effectively removing it from the carbon cycle. That said, the process is very slow, but it's not as slow as the, um, the, the rate of turning um, carbon into fossil fuels, which we then burn and um, release them. So you, within a terrestrial forest, you might store, uh, you might hit an equilibrium within its, its um, carbon sequestration within 20 years, but in a coastal habitat, um, it might take 200 years to reach the same level. But the interesting point is it does not stop. It continues sequestering carbon year after year after year after year. Um, so seagrasses and, and salt marsh regeneration is something that's really quite an effective or should be um, part of the suite of things that we think about when trying to lock up um, this excess carbon that we're releasing from, from emissions. Um, just on the point of the IPCC, so the IPCC carbon inventory has a um, has a, a process of assessing its um, um, terrestrial habitats. And whilst it recognizes that seagrasses, salt marshes, and other coastal vegetative habitats play an important part in a country's um, carbon inventory, because there is no agreed international assessment method of how we, uh, how we understand the, the, the amount of carbon within these habitats, um, it's currently not involved in the, um, uh, within that uh, uh, IPCC inventory. However, work is hopefully taking place to include seagrasses in the future. So what it's effectively doing is acting like a filter um, to catch organic matter, putting it on the seabed, and then that rate of sediment accumulation over time um, means that it stores the carbon more efficiently than um, terrestrial, uh, terrestrial woodlands. 
So in the absence of uh, seagrasses, we have um, sediment uh, able to wash around, um, as well as we're losing that complex three-dimensional habitat for our, um, for our species, for our, our coastal species to use as nursery, hatchery and, and um, foraging grounds. So it's, it's when you actually assess the economic value or the ecosystem services value of, of some coastal vegetative habitats, so seagrasses um, being one, the, the value in terms of what it provides to us is, is huge. Um, so throughout the, um, the project, the, the remedies project, what we want to try and understand is if there isn't this, this growth of, um, if seagrasses aren't recolonizing the areas where they once were, we'd like to give them a helping hand. And the right hand picture is um, um, some Zostra marina, subtitled Zostra marina, that's grown from seed and that's been stored in the aquarium for now for a couple of years. Um, and the, we simply use sort of estuarine sediments to grow those in. Um, they're under halogen lamps, um, so they're getting enough light. Um, and we feed them a very sort of basic uh, nutrient feed. And as you can see, they're doing very well. Um, so within the Remedies Project, what we would like to do is um, try and kickstart the regeneration of these, of these beds, of these areas, because seagrass will grow between 45 and 90 centimeters a year horizontally, so asexually by cloning itself, or um, through seed. Now much of the seed, the, the life cycle of the plant is um, it, it dies back during the winter and then in the spring we see it, it, it grow back in length and, and um, in density. And then through May, June and July we see, the, um, uh, we see it flower with reproductive, uh, with um, uh, um, well, fertilization of those flowers from pollen which then produce reproductive shoots that have seeds. Um, now, many of those seeds are washed from the seed bank um, in the autumn when, uh, when the, the day length becomes shorter, the, the water temperature becomes colder. So the, folk, the, the plant is, isn't photosynthesizing so much, so it starts dying back. These uh, reproductive shoots also die back, fall on the ground, and um, the seeds are then meant to work their way into the, uh, into the seed bank and the sediment. Um, and also they can be washed to different areas and start new beds. So within the Remedies Project, what we want to do is um, give nature here a helping hand, collect the seeds at the pinnacle point of the year, so during August and September, um, store those seeds within a, a closed environment with, and um, effectively rot the seeds from the seed space and then collect all the seeds. Um, now, the thing that's going to prompt the germanization of those seeds and the growth of those plants um, is a, a sort of exposure to cold. So there's a hormone within the seed that stops it growing. Um, and when it's exposed to cold, that hormone is, is eroded. And then with an increase in temperature, uh, a growth hormone takes over and it's time for the embryo to start growing. So two strategies, really. We want to try and stop the seeds being lost to sea, and then um, seed broadcast. And also, um, if we are able to germinate in a closed environment, um, bring those plants on to sort of seedling size, maybe um, seven and a half, 10 centimeters in size, see if transplanting those out, um, enables the habitat to, to take a hold. If those plants are able to stay there and grow, um, then there should be vegetative growth sideways. Um, we've got some additional work that's going on outside of this project to, to see how plants interact with the um, sort of hydrodynamics of the environment. Because if we're going to place these plants within, back in, into the environment, we need to understand how they're interacting with the, the, the currents and, and 
um, tidal flows around them, else all of the work that we do could be a complete waste of time. So the picture on the left here is a, a series of wet tables. Um, they are, I think, um, 40 centimeters deep. And um, we've got uh, um, a temperature control on that system of between, I think, 10 and 16 degrees. Um, so when the seeds, within two streams of uh, restoration effort will broadcast some during the autumn so they're naturally um, naturally vernonized and we'll see what uh, what their growth rate is um, but also vernonizing and then planting into a closed um, system closed aquaria system we can create the, the perfect environment for these to grow so we can control temperature uh, that system also allows us to emulate tidal flow over the top um, and also day length, and those LEDs have got, um, uh, you can control them very finely to the point of, um, depending on how much photosynthetic available radiation the plant receives at different times of the day for different periods and um, over every, um, every different wavelength of the spectrum. So it's an interesting lab that we're building, um, and the intention is to, with our seeds in our, in our little um, uh, growing um, sort of plug plants, if you like, bring them, on in the, um, bring them on in the aquarium. And then when we come to our optimum planting period, probably this time next year, uh, when the weather's nicer, the water's getting a little bit warmer, we don't have um, so much danger of storms, then we'll try um, planting those planting units out. And in addition with some of the other work that we're, we're trying to understand with regards to how the plant interacts with its, its um, tidal environment or water flow environment, then we should be able to um, pick optimum sites through, um, through um, some modeling work. And the aim is through involvement with the Remedies Project is to bring eight hectares of um, um, special area of conservation. So four hectares in Plymouth Sound and four hectares in Solent Maritime back into favorable condition through interventions of, um, of different um, uh, seed broadcast and, and seedling planting. And there is, I think, a, I'm not going to talk too much about um, diving or, or volunteer diving. I, hopefully Fee spoke about that yesterday. Um, but with Marine Conservation Society and, and Sea Search being a partner within this um, within this project, then um, there is a wealth of, of assessment and um, planting and, and um, sort of monitoring uh, opportunities to get involved in. Um, so, just a, a really, I've sort of spoke about what we tried to. We, what we're going to try to do with regards to these plants, we, we endeavour to collect 600,000 seeds per annum um, and then grow them within 50% um, of those within, a, in, within an aquarium with an intention to get nine plants within each metre squared and um, replicating that planting strategy with regards to our seed broadcast. That means um, we have. Um, with uh, presumably a, or some of our work so far has produced about roughly about a 33% germination rate um, for us to produce the amount of plants that we need to plant out um, one hectare we need in the vicinity of um, 300,000 seeds so our dives are going to take place in um, sort of from late July to mid September when, it, when we're possible to collect those seeds um, and then working on the principle that we've got six divers on board and everybody is um, that knows really what they're looking at and, and by um, support of um, um, information from um, other divers where they're seeing flowering plants, um, then hopefully we'll, we'll be in a position to collect that volume of seed. Um, and then throughout the summer, then we're almost directly into um, our broadcast through the late autumn. And then we'll be looking to transplant our planting units that we've created in the aquarium 
um, over the spring and then we're straight back into it again in the summer. So there's, there's a lot of diving activity and a lot of effort being placed upon um, the restoration efforts. Historically, um, you know, Zostra marina, the species that we've got in the UK, um, there have been successful, firstly, seed broadcast trials and planting transplantation trials um, throughout, um, throughout Europe and through, um, throughout the US. Um, it's quite ambitious. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite complicated um, and we, need some, we certainly need some help. But uh, when you look at other species of seagrass, uh, so, some types of posidonia, um, the attempt at trying to regenerate or, or kickstart the, the positive feedback of that, um, that habitat through seedling transplantation might not be possible because they're sort of, um, they're a little bit more of a persistent species rather than sort of opportunistically looking for places to grow. Um, so divers uh, have the opportunity to get involved in fisheries management and I think that was some of the work that um, historically I was involved in at the aquarium was to try and understand the significance of, of um, seagrasses and a little bit more about our um, British coastal habitats. Um, but by getting involved in, in these types of projects and, and being and supporting them, um, same uh, exactly as Sea Search does. Um, what it's doing is giving people the opportunity to sort of get involved within fisheries management and sort of case coastal stakeholders and fishery stakeholders. So it is sort of positive, um, positive win-win situation for everyone if, if we can do it correctly. Um, so I think I don't know how long I've been. Matt, you might be able to tell me. Um, yeah. So this all sits part of the, the remedies project at present, and um, there is other work that uh, other organisations are all sort of involved in, and we're trying to collectively work together. But if any of you got have any questions, then you might be able to um, try and sort of get them to me through Matt. And if you'd like to email me anything, then there's my email. We've got um, quite a few people have been posing questions during the presentation, Mark. If, if that's okay. Can I go through a couple of these? Yeah, what I'll do is I'll stop sharing my screen. That's it. So we've got, um, Josh has asked how much would a mooring system cost to make and install? Uh, I'm guessing, you know, um, obviously all moorings cost money, don't they? It's just how much different is this price going to be to have it as an advantage? Yeah, so there's a couple of different elements of that mooring. There is the anchor and there is the, the riser. Um, with regards to the the let's just focus upon the two different anchors at the minute there's a concrete block which is effectively um a uh, a collection of concrete with the chain and, and all wrapped up in a in a, a, a uh, tractor tire and the cost of that is probably in the region of about three to four hundred pounds worth of materials um the helical screw is considerably more expensive in the sense that it, the materials aren't expensive, it's the deployment of it that's expensive. Um, whereas you can see from the riser that we placed in the video, um, you just need to understand how you're gonna float the chain. And it would actually be quite an interesting school project if you, if you had um, whatever flotation that you had, um, then understanding how to balance that that flotation on whatever weight and length and gauge chain that you have. At present, the, the complete mooring install, including the, the helical screw and the riser and the pickup buoy, um, comes in uh, for uh, in the re region of about £1,400 for us, um, which in comparison to traditional moorings, uh, I believe is in the region of about seven to eight hundred pounds but it's the additional labour put in with um, deploying the helical screw. Yeah. Okay. Um, what have we got? We've got a couple more questions coming through. So, how do you prevent subsurface floats from tangling together or fouling with other debris? 
as we roll up. Can you repeat that, please? And how how uh, do you prevent subsurface floats from tangling together or fouling with other debris? That's the question. Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, we trialled the design in Sulcum, and then we trialled it in um, Corsand, and then we've taken our, our subsequent um, sort of industry ready, if you like, our professional option um, in Corsands. And nobody was really sure whether they were going to cause, firstly, navigational hazards, um, whether they were going to foul, and um, whether that was going to cause sort of complication in the mooring. It's not, it's something that we obviously monitor over time. And the, we've got five very enthusiastic and very supportive volunteers in Corsands that are trialing this, this latest iteration that's um, in, in um, conjunction with Princess. Um, and we haven't had any fouling. We haven't, because you can, and there's no navigational hazard because when there's nothing on the mooring, then what they end up doing is sort of that catenary effect of pulling the chains together. Um, so they sort of sit in the water column and people, when boating, seem to give pickup boys a wide berth. Um, we've only deployed, I think, historically eight. At and the Remedies op offers an opportunity to trial a full mooring field um, and see the interaction of the boat with how um, are there any additional complications to creating a whole mooring field of them um, rather than just trialing them in, in individual um, locations? Uh, one thing I suppose that I did make the, the focus upon the presentation was we limited the impact of the um, on the uh, um, benthic community, um, but we're also interested in creating a solution that is is um, adoptable by harbour authorities reasonably easily and we'll see yeah definitely it has to be it has to be something that harbour authorities want to put in isn't it it does yeah. um, the other thing as well is um just a question from me is that you know the the helical screw is i can see it's a really good idea if it's in an area where seagrass is definitely going to grow back but you will some, some of these um, areas, they're using heavy concrete, uh, granite bases that take up a lot less space and they're already in, in situ. And you'd gain quite a lot, you were saying from your talk, by just using a modifier and a riser in that situation anyway. You know, that's a lot cheaper option. Is that something that you would sort of encourage where? Yeah, I think that's when we started working with Solcom Harbour Authority, the idea was to create something that could retrospectively be fitted. Yeah. And if the block's in place, then then this type of adaptation is reasonably simple, is reasonably cheap, um, and it can be done as uh, each mooring is serviced with regards yeah. to this chain gate. So they just replace the a standard riser with a, a sterling riser. Um, so, yeah. But then, yeah, so there could be areas where that's very appropriate, and then other areas where maybe the substrate is perfect for seagrass that we might want to go and look at another option. Yeah, it's interesting. The helical screw, the minimum length of it is two meters, so the bedrock needs to be obviously the <laughs> yeah. two meters, else it's just not going to go into it. Um, and what we try to do is achieve enough torque on the on the installation so it's a bit like a, a corkscrew and there's a point where it becomes so hard to screw into the ground that the vertical force required to pull that pin out of the ground um, is in the region of about 12 tons so with displacement of concrete in water i believe it's about sort of 0.6 um, of, of, the, of a concrete block within the water is it, its holding strength. Um, helical screws are a very, very stable and strong way of anchoring things to the seabed, pretty much more, well, much more so than using concrete blocks.
it's just a little bit more complicated. Used in a lot of other countries as well, I've heard as well. Yeah. Um, excellent. Um, and Tim said, if each loop of chain doesn't quite reach the boy below, I'm not sure exactly, Tim, what you meant by that. Um, there was a different person who asked but the other questions. Maybe if Tim can come back to you on that. Um, Sue asked, how many of these mornings have been used in the trials? Um, so far? So far, well, the Ocean Conservation and Trust in, in um, collaboration with Marine Conservation Society and Princess Yachts, we installed five last year. Um, and that's a final engineering solution of various iterations that the, um, that the Ocean Conservation Trust um, tried to develop. Through remedies, I think there is a, a 80 over the whole south coast of the UK. Um, so there'll be a combination of different mooring um, constructions, if you like. Some will be the sterling mooring, some will be bungee moorings, and, and it's really down to Fiona and the Natural England team which ones they select to use. But the idea is to install a mooring field of them to understand the interactions between boats moving around, navigation hazards, and the benthic impact as well. Excellent. And um, Sue also then asked, have the seeds we collected last year, have you been used yet? <laughs> we, they are still in cold storage. Um, so we've got about 40,000 seats at present, which is a really small fraction of what we actually needed. And as soon as the seagrass lab system is running, then that's our, our next priority is to plant those out and get them under those, uh, get them under the lamps and bring the water temperature up and see how many grow. Um, so Rebecca asked, is climate change and ocean acidification affecting seagrass? Um, not necessarily ocean acidification, um, but with increased with increased wave action, then our coastal vegetative habitats are going to, our seagrasses, I should just say, are going to, they're going to be exposed to a lot more um, energy. And um, so acidification, possibly not the case, um, but there is a danger that uh, they're just, they just washed away, um, but a big, strong, healthy bed um, can actually survive a survive a storm. So, yeah, and um, you know, and also the as they both synthesise, the plants themselves are removing carbon, aren't they? So, and, and you know, the more carbon dioxide dissolved in the water, actually, the quicker plants grow. So, it's yeah, I think a nice, neat sort of answer. Although, I think if they're more, if they're really healthy and really robust. Well, if they're really healthy, they're really robust, but with additional pressures, and if they're, they're sparse and they're, they're fragmented, then any additional storm, um, storm action on those does just fragment it even more until it just disappears. So it's trying to keep after, look after what we've got. Um, and then someone asked, um, does removing that amount of seed from a healthy area affect its ability to expand naturally? So you were talking about collecting quite large amounts of seed. I, would be, I haven't actually seen one of these seeds. I don't really know what they look like or how I was many. I going to take a picture, wasn't I? Yeah, yeah. how many you get from each plant. But you know, you're talking thousands and thousands, and it does sort of sound almost a bit horrifying. But is is yeah, is it going is it going to have an impact on that healthy area by removing lots of seeds? Um, so what we're doing is we're choosing areas that that are identified by Natural England as being not in decline yeah um so all of the beds within the special areas of conservation um have been designated as in unfavorable conditions so it would be unsuitable for us to go and collect seeds from those areas so we are um we're looking to natural england for the steer of where to go some of these beds are quite large they're healthy um i suppose anecdotally for myself some of them flower um in very high abundances and some of them don't and that sort of changes from year to year so the um, the intention is to select our, our healthy beds um, that have high reproductive shoot counts 
but also not to just drop in and, and try and collect as many as we can, but to just sort of collect one, skip one, collect one, skip one, collect one, skip one. Um, and with such a high amount of seed lost in, um, in winter storms out of the seed bank, um, then, um, uh, well, you'd like to think that hopefully we're not having an impact because we're choosing the correct beds. Yeah. And Rebecca also asked, how do you get involved in volunteering for seagrass projects and can anyone volunteer? Um, e yes, at, um, at the moment we've got, uh, in what capacity? Because the, there's a lot of... It doesn't say. <laughs> um, yeah. um, from a diving perspective, I think the monitoring work is going to be coordinated by um, the sea search coordinators in, in different regions. Um, with regards to the plantation work, that'll be done through the Ocean Conservation Trust. Um, and uh, there are other volunteering opportunities because there's various sort of engagement bits and pieces that we'd like to do, um, working with schools. Um, but with the project in a little, starting off reasonably slowly at the minute um, uh, because of COVID-19, yeah. um, it's, it's a little bit hard to answer what that's going to look like. Yeah, so certainly any divers who want to get involved in sea search need to get in touch with us. Um, we expect you to be qualified to a minimum standard. Um, all that information is on our website. But also contact, the, uh, contact you as well, Mark, if they're interested in helping with your diving projects. Well, yeah, um, I'd like... I'd like to think all of the diving activity is sort of working together and we've yeah. probably got a great pool of, of dedicated people. Um, one of the things I would say from those of you that have any involvement um, with me through the uh, CSI, um, the CSI's remit was to um, broaden the scope or, or broaden the interest of, of people within seagrass conservation. Um, the task within this project is, is very focused and it's probably going to require a um, higher level of diving um, qualification and experience. And Fiona yesterday said as well there's recreational surveys going to be going on looking at the amount of recreational boating in, in these areas as well so that's another way we want to get involved. So we've got um, how do you physically collect the seeds? Mark, Mark asked that. Well, you'd have to go diving and try and find them, wouldn't you? Like yeah, it. so the canopy height could be 30 to 50 centimetres, and it's a dark, single strap leaf. Um, once you see a reproductive shoot, um, then they are very different. They're, they're taller, they are... Um, much brighter in color and they're branched so each branch has a spathe which which contains the seed so what we do is we just fin along and, and as i said sort of pick the beds that are healthy and then collect one leave one collect one leave one collect one leave one and then carry on and do you physically break to snap off the whole branch or just a little bit yeah, I'd sort of snap it off from the base, remove it, uh, uh, not to disturb the rhizomes or the root structure, but just pinch it, um, pinch it with a thumbnail and it, it comes out. And then place it into a mesh bag and carry on to the next one. Excellent. Um, so Donald Griffin has asked, well, he said 90% um, loss of seagrass is huge and, and very sad. What study is this from and over what time frame? So a group in Swansea have done some habitat suitability models and um, there is about 80,000 hectares of seagrass that's, that's uh, uh, suitable habitat for seagrasses. Um, and the amount of recorded seagrass that we have is, is about 7,000 hectares. The um, thing is people didn't really start monitoring or, or paying any attention to seagrasses um, until um, the sort of 40s and 50s. There was a, 
a recorded or a, there was a mass dieback infection um, from a bacterial infection from um, the 1930s and people said wait a minute we've lost all of this stuff that was was under the um, under the sea here um, but it's from I believe the papers in review um, if uh, if it hasn't been published already and that's from the, uh, the Swansea group based um, at the Sustainable uh, Environmental Centre they're looking at seagrass loss. Mm, okay. like, um, and then uh, Mary asked and I think this has kind of been answered already, is the aim of the project at any stage to modify some of the existing moorings? And I think you already sort of said that that could be appropriate in some areas. I think it's up to the Harbour Authority. So yeah. Natural England would travel to the Harbour Authority, speak to um, whatever the requirements of each Harbour Authority are and then provide the solution. And um, that you already answered Donald's question, which is how many moorings would you put in in the scope of remedies? I think you said 80. 80, yeah. Moorings in total. Good. In two, and those are, are those just in the two SACs or is that in all of the SACs? Um, it's, it's possible to put them over all of the SACs, yeah. but it really depends upon how the, the Harbour Authority reacts to um, to the request to be involved in the trial. For example, the Isles of Scilly, um, they might not be a good place to start um, because it's a, a sort of um, approach really of, of raising awareness that uh, there's a lot of seagrasses around the Isles of Scilly, they're, they're in loss and, and let's think about doing something about it. And these are examples of other places that are uh, trialing these type of moorings so maybe that's subsequently further down the line. Um, that's brilliant. I think we're, we're nearly at the end of the questions here now. Uh, all, I, don't, I don't want to keep everyone on for, for ages longer um, so I'm just going to sort of pick and choose a few more but I'll send you this list as well of the chat, you know, the chat list after so you can get back to me. Sure. Um, can can it only be used in deep more deep sea moorings? Um, can it be used in all types of seabed? You're saying yeah. You're saying it needs you need to drill down with that helical screw, and you can't drill down into stone, hard stone, can you? Very well, yeah. Because of the style of of mooring that we're using, um, well, I suppose the point would be is if it's in deep sea, uh, what um, what habitat are you effectively trying to reduce the impact on? Yeah. So then ad adopt the suitable solution. Yeah. Someone's asked, how is a helical screw deployed? Is a good how question. is a helical screw deployed? It's not very simple, is it? No, it's not very simple. Um, it's a two meter long pile with a couple of sort of helices on um, and there is a, a, a hydraulic um, torque, rotating torque head and a surface supplied diver goes down with the screw, down with the uh, effectively giant socket set um, that is the hydraulic um, wrench and um, screws it into the ground until you get to the correct amount of um, sort of torque on on that head and if if it's not at the required torque you have to put a two meter extension on so some of these are four meters into the ground i've seen you keep digging them down deeper and deeper until they hold strong enough yeah it's holding power is directly related to the amount of torque that's on that pin. So if you have four kilonewtons of torque on the rotation of the, um, heli the helical screw, um, then it would take 12 tons of vertical uplift to pull that out of the ground. Pretty good. Excellent. Uh, and the final question is how are seagrass beds affected by other pressures like land use runoff and sewage pollution, which is another, another great 
good question because it, it does have an impact, I would, I would imagine. It does have an impact, and I think one of the big, one of the things that I didn't cover in this talk, and um, when you think about the ecosystem services values of seagrasses, um, there is obviously a carbon value and a fisheries value, but when you look at the, the nitrogen stripping value of, of seagrasses, it's astronomical, um, probably more so than any other um, any other ecosystem service. So it can strip um, nitrogen out of the water um, in the same sort of mechanism that it's storing carbon, um, but it can uh, it can be heavily affected through excess phosphates and nitrates through algal growth and, and it just stops the plant photosynthesizing. Um, so they're a little bit, these habitats are a little bit sort of like the barometer of the health of our coastal watercourses. If our seagrasses bed, beds aren't doing very well, then it sort of implies that all of our coastal habitats are, are under, under threat. Um, so yes, they are affected through excess nutrients and phosphate. I suppose when you're choosing areas to do restoration, that's going to be a consideration. You don't want a place that could get inundated with nutrients that could threaten your survival of your plants in the future. Yeah, so Exeter University are running habitat suitability models um, on where where which geographical, between I suppose, Plymouth Sound and the Solent, yeah. where it's best to position those, uh, those restorative efforts. Yeah, I think it's fascinating to, to, to do that and to actually then go down to an area where seagrass, all the conditions should be right for seagrass and find out if the seagrass is there and if it's not, why, and try and you know, whether it could be an area that's suitable for recolonization. Yeah. It's not there, and one of the things that, um, it, really interesting about a job is some of the hydrodynamics sort of studies that we're trying to work on because just deploying the plant in um in an area where you think it might grow um you might actually be doing something wrong that's that's going to stop it taking hold so um trying to understand the interactions between the plant and the the hydrodynamic environment is is quite interesting it sort of plays to my historic strengths being more interested in physical oceanography. Yeah, yeah but at least you've got a technical approach because I think mean, you need it because there's so many different um, factors at play. Anyway, so uh, that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and uh, I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed it. This is going to go straight up onto YouTube. So if you've got a friend who might be interested, he hasn't had a chance to join us today, they can watch it back. And um, any further questions for, for Mark or, or for, for Fiona yesterday or for myself, please get in touch. And uh, as you heard from there, we will be looking for help from volunteers, particularly divers, but um, other people too. So, uh, so yeah, watch this space. And, um, you know, when we're all allowed back out again, it's all going to kick off, I'm sure. And uh, it'll be a, it'll be a great project to be part of. So, yeah, looking forward to it, Mark. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, well, great. Everyone, been great seeing all the amazing creatures going past your head as well. It's been a bit distracting at times. So they all they all look very healthy and uh, Big lemon shark. Must come up and see them in person one day soon. You're more than right. welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, all the best everyone. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. All right. I'm just gonna um, stop the video.